the walls of this city will fall down flat. Go in the strength you have and save Israel. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight. You will shepherd my people. You will become their ruler. Last year we began this series, Origin Story, and we looked at the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and we saw how in Genesis God said, I'm going to bring through Abraham a nation that's going to bless all the world. In other words, he was going to create this nation of the Hebrew people, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, was going to come through that nation. And so we began to follow that, and we, we, we saw how in Exodus they were slaves for 430 years, and God raised up Moses to be the deliverer and set them free. We saw the book of Leviticus, God taught them how to worship for the first time because they had never had the freedom to worship him. We saw in the book of Numbers where they didn't go into the promised land. God said, I'm going to give it to you. But they, they balked. They didn't go in. And they ended up wandering through the desert for 40 years. And then we saw in the book of Deuteronomy, they got back to the promised land. They got back to the Jordan River. And that's where we ended our series. Now, I picked it up again this year. And this year, we're calling the origin story, Welcome to the Promised Land. And my goal is to do five books every year. That means I get to stay 13 more years. How's that for job security, right? Right. So that's what we're going to do. And so now we're going to be in Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel. So far, we've looked at Joshua and Judges. This weekend, uh, we've come to Ruth. And as you're going to see right away, uh, Ruth is during the time of the Judges. And you're going to see she doesn't, she doesn't fit her time. Uh, she's a woman of charm, grace, dignity, character, elegance, and yet she is born in this incredibly hard, difficult, dark time. But she comes along as a calming influence that reminds us that no matter what's going on around us, there's always hope. It reminds us that no matter how dark the world may be, there are always going to be some people, there's always going to be a remnant of individuals who want to walk with God. There's always going to be some people who have a desire to please him, to be obedient. There are always going to be people who are like, regardless of what everybody else is doing, I'm going to do life God's way. And if you were here last weekend, you know that the book of Ruth comes on the hills of a time in Israel's history where everyone was doing whatever they wanted to do. Every man was doing what was right in their own eyes. And we talked about it was a time of chaos. It was a time of anarchy. But what's interesting is out of that chaos, it's as if the Spirit of God places a bright, white, beautiful diamond on the black velvet of that culture in which Ruth lived. And she sparkles against her time. It's like, it's like a sigh of relief after the book of Judges. Let me give you a little bit of background before we jump into the story this weekend. The name of the book comes from the name of the woman who is the heroine of the book. Her name is Ruth. Uh, her name appears for the very first time in Ruth chapter 1, verse 4. It appears again at the latter part of the book, Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. And then it only appears one other place in the entire Bible. It's this one obscure genealogical table. So she's kind of like a meteor in the sky. She's like, she's like a swish. Now you see her, now you don't. But the impact she made in her times, absolutely incredible. And you get the setting of the story of Ruth in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, so it's the same time period that we looking, looked at last week, it said there was a famine in the land. Now, that just basically means there was nothing to eat. If you were hungry, you couldn't just run down to Hardee's or the food line and get something to eat. In those days, people had to find where there was food, and they had to move to wherever the food was. So you see in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and you probably, you're like, I've heard his name somewhere. It's from that great song, in the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight, right? Elimelech, Elimelech, Elimelech. That's, that's where, no, I'm just kidding. That's not really where it came from, but it, it seemed to fit. It, I just like saying Elimelech. It's just, it's just a great name. But anyway, the man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, they went to Moab and lived there. So this Jewish family, they're forced to relocate 
because of the famine. And so they find food, uh, they find water, they find farm that they can, you know, the farm that they can land uh, or land that they can farm. They find it all in the land of Moab. So they move there and just about the time it looks like things are looking up. Things get worse. In fact, tragedy strikes. You read in Ruth chapter one, verse three. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband died and she was left with her two sons. And so now understand all of a sudden we have a widow all alone with these two boys and evidently these boys are of marrying age so they marry a couple of Moabite women which means they weren't Jews they were Gentiles one's name is Orpah the other's name is Ruth but then things get even worse when you get to chapter 1 verse 5 of Ruth both Malon and Kilion also died and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband now we don't know how the boys died could have been a common death. Maybe they, you know, the deaths occurred close to one another. But all of a sudden, Naomi, who moves to Moab with this family, now she finds herself not only a widow, but now she finds herself without her kids. I mean, it is a heartbreaking scene. It kind of reminds me of the old nationwide commercial. Remember, you know, life comes at you fast. And that's just the way it is sometimes. It just seems that one thing comes right after another. But this is what you're going to see. You're going to see a profound message that comes from this book over and over and over again. And the message is this. God doesn't leave us in hard times. He doesn't leave us in hard times. But let me say this. In the middle of those hard times, I mean, if you're in the middle of a storm right now, see, we question that, don't we? In fact, that's often when we question the goodness of God the most. But as you're going to see in this story, when we're going through tough times, that's when God is the nearest to us. In fact, let me give you a verse that will help you if you're in the middle of a storm, if you're in the middle of a tough time right now. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. He writes this, and I, I want to give it to you from the Living Bible. I love this translation. If you will humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God in his good time, not ours, in his good time, he will lift you up. Let him have all your worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. After you have suffered a little while, our God, who is full of kindness through Christ, will give you his eternal glory. He personally, I love this, he personally will come and pick you up and set you firmly in place and make you stronger than ever. You are going to see that principle all over this story. See, when I doubt God the most, that's when God cares the most. In other words, when I'm frustrated with God, you ever get frustrated with God? You ever get angry at God? You ever question God like, God, what are you thinking? When I get so frustrated with God that I'm just ready to shake my fist in God's face, you know what God's response is? He just kind of opens his arms and says, come on, talk to me. Get it off your chest. What's going on, right? But I'm telling you, if you find yourself losing hope, that's when God is the nearest. You see it in this story. I mean, just about the time that Naomi, I'm sure, is at the end of her rope, Ruth comes along as a source of encouragement to her mother-in-law. And just about the time that I am confident that Ruth is prepared, she will live out her life as a single woman. God had a man waiting and ready in the wings. It is a beautiful story. As I said, it's kind of like a Hallmark movie, but without the cheesy bad acting. Okay, without that, right? Now, if this were a play, I would call chapter one, act one, and I would refer to it as the right reaction to adversity when you have hard times and trouble in your life. Let me show it to you. After all of this tragedy, it says in Ruth chapter one, verse six, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, in other words, that would be the Jewish people, by providing food for them, in other words, the famine is over, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living, that would be Moab, and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Now keep in mind, Orpah and Ruth are Gentiles. They're not Jews. And I'm telling you, in those days, if you were a Gentile in a Jewish land, so you were as out of place as a UNC athlete in a classroom. You know what I'm saying? They just, they just, they just don't go together. See? But regardless, regardless, okay. These girls go back to Bethlehem. They go back to Judah with their mother-in-law. But Naomi, as she's thinking about this, that these girls are going back with me, she starts to think, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't, this doesn't feel fair. These girls, they have their whole lives ahead of them. You know, they need to stay here. 
They need to find a man. They need to settle down. They need to get married. They need to start a family. And so that's what she tells him in verse eight. Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. In other words, go back to Moab. Stay in Moab. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. She's like, I appreciate what you're doing, but you don't owe me anything. Stay here. Get married. Start a family. But the girls, see, they're not comfortable with that. But Naomi, she keeps insisting, please don't go. Get on with your life. Finally, Orpah decides, I will stay. I will stay. But not Ruth. Look at what it says in Ruth chapter 1, verse 14. At this they wept aloud again. <clears throat> then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. And I want you to see the level of commitment that Ruth had for Naomi. Look at verse 16. This is what Ruth says. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. That's commitment. And so Naomi heads back to Bethlehem with Ruth in tow, and it's as if the curtain drops on Act 1 when you get to Ruth, verse 22. It says, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And now you get to Act 2. I refer to Act 2 as the right response to loneliness. You can see it in Ruth chapter 2. Now remember, Ruth doesn't know anybody. She has no friends. She is, I mean, she is a Gentile in a Jewish world. And you can imagine all the loss that she's experienced. Not only has she lost her husband, now she's walked away and left all of her family back in Moab. So she, she's surrounded by all of these feelings of loneliness. And she has nothing to do. She has nothing to do. So she decides, man, I got to get busy doing something, which is good advice. She's like, I can either just stay at home, wallow around in my self-pity, or I can do something. I need to do something. So she decides to try her hand at farming. Ruth chapter 2, verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Now, she doesn't know where to go. She doesn't have any contacts. But she thinks, hey, it's harvest time. There's got to be people out in the field harvesting. Maybe I can hook on with the crew somewhere. So she just goes out, randomly picks a field, you know, randomly finds a row and just goes to work. Verse 3, Ruth chapter 2, she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. In other words, they had gone through, they had harvested, but now she was coming behind, picking out anything that was left. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Well, wait a second. Here we have a guy named Boaz, who's a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. Now, let me just say something. I think that finding a husband was probably the furthest thing from Ruth's mind. But I'm going to tell you something. That's often the way it happens. I mean, that's the way that God often operates. She, she just wants to stay busy. She just wants to keep her mind occupied off of all of her troubles. And it just so happens that she picks a field randomly, that just so happens to be owned by a man named Boaz who just happens to be eligible. Ruth chapter two, verse four. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the Harvard, harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of the harvesters, who does that young woman belong to. Well, now, now the plot thickens, right? So think of it this way. While Ruth is out in the field gleaning, Boaz is leaning. Mm. <laughs> Who is that? You know, but even more, he's wondering, is she taken? Is she taken? And he hears this beautiful answer in Ruth chapter two, verse six. The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So she's a hard worker. 
So Boaz is like, I got, I got to meet this girl. So he starts making his way over to, you know, over to Ruth. He's thinking, how am I going to break the ice? You know, he's, he's going through his pickup lines, you know. Finally, he settles and he goes over and says, hi, I'm Boaz. What's your name? Or should I call you mine? Maybe he used that one. I don't know if he used that one or not. But anyway, came up with a great pickup line, right? Now, and he goes up to her and he says, listen, I don't want you to work anywhere else. And I love what he adds in Ruth chapter two, verse nine. I've told the man not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the man have filled. Verse 10. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. And Boaz is like, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with you. You know what that tells me, by the way? It tells me that when you're a godly person, as you're going to see in the story Boaz is, when you are a godly person, character matters. In fact, if God opens the door for marriage in your life, I just can, I'm going to tell you, character is far more important than anything else you have to bring into a marriage relationship. Because I'm telling you, when the chips are down and the romance and the honeymoon is over, by the way, psychiatrists tell us about 90% of the romance that you bring into your marriage is gone in the first 18 months. So you got 10% to stretch out for the next 50, 60 years, right? So when the honeymoon is over and it's tough sledding, and it will be tough sledding, it's character that will keep you together. It's commitment that will keep you together. So Boaz, he's, he's heard about Ruth, and you know what? He is impressed with her character. Now, later that evening, Ruth is back home. Naomi and Ruth are having dinner together. And Naomi's probably, you know, hey, tell me about your day. Did you find somewhere to, to work today? And says, yeah, I mean, I, I went. I worked all day, a lot of hard work. And it's kind of cool, though. You know, I met the nicest guy. Strange name, though, Boaz. You ever heard anybody named Boaz before? And, you know, of course, Naomi, she, you know, she chokes on her KFC because she, she knows Boaz. She's like, Boaz, right? And so Ruth chapter 2, verse 20, the man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian Redeemers. Now, you, can, you don't care about that. You can't appreciate that unless you understand the law of the guardian redeemer, sometimes referred to as the family redeemer, other times referred to in the Bible as, as the kinsman redeemer. But in the days of the Jews, there was a law that was established to help widows who were left without any assistance. And they came up with this idea of the guardian redeemer. And the guardian redeemer was a close family living relative. And that guardian redeemer had several responsibilities. First of all, he was to avenge any violence done against the late husband. So if there was any justice that needed to be brought, he was in charge of that. Second, he was to manage any estate that was left over for the widow. And then third, if it was appropriate, he could actually marry the widow. Now, that's the law of the guardian redeemer. Naomi knows all about this, right? She's like, Boaz! Man, he is one of our guardian redeemers. And she says, let me explain to you how this stuff works, right? And the curtain falls on act two. You get to act three, chapter three. Things start to come together. I call this act the right response to companionship. Now, you remember, Naomi wasn't that excited about Ruth coming with her. She fought, probably feels responsible for Ruth coming with her back to, back to Bethlehem. So she's got her good at heart. And she explains to Ruth how the culture that she's now living in works. And I'm going to read a verse to you, but I don't recommend you try this, but this is how it worked back then, okay? Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. One day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley, and that's when they would take the barley, throw it up in the air, the husk, the chaff would blow away because it was lighter, and the barley would fall to the ground. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Look at the advice. Wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes, 
Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. You know what that tells me? Naomi understands men. Don't bother him while he's eating. Let him finish. Let him get full. And then when he goes to bed, that's when you make your move. No. Ruth 3 verse 4. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go, this gets kind of weird. Go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Ruth answered, hey, I'll do whatever you say, right? Now, again, I don't write this stuff. I just teach this stuff. But it, if I'm reading this, I'm thinking, Naomi's setting Ruth up. This is a practical joke, right? She's punking her. That's what's going on here, right? But if interesting, you do the research, you'll discover that this is still practiced today in some Arab cultures. It's the practice of a girl, if there's a man she's interested in, getting next to that guy while he's asleep, placing part of his garment over her body, and it was as if to say, I want to get to know you, right? And Ruth responds, oh, really? That's what I'm supposed to do, huh? Weird. Sounds a little kinky. Why not? You know? So anyway, now remember, Boaz has never read the book of Ruth. So he has no idea what's getting ready to happen, right? But Ruth follows Naomi's instructions to a T. Boaz finishes his meal, big belly, goes off, call it a day. Ruth chapter 3, verse 7. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. And then about midnight, Boaz wakes up. And there's a girl lying at his feet. And he knows it's not every night that you wake up and find a girl lying at your feet. So Ruth chapter 3, verse 9, who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. And immediately, Boaz has a couple of reasons why this is never going to work, which tells me he's been thinking about this. The first reason is, I think, an age issue. If you read the story, you get the feeling that Boaz was considerably older than Ruth. But the second reason was actually a legal reason. He knew that he wasn't the closest family guardian redeemer. Maybe he was number two. Maybe he was number three in line, but he knew that he wasn't number one. So it says in Ruth chapter three, verse 12, although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I am. In other words, I'm not first in line. And I think, I think Ruth's heart must have sunk. She probably thought, dang it. But the other guy looks like Quasimodo. You know what I'm saying? Why? Why couldn't it just be Mr. McDreamy here? Right, right. Natural films, I get it. But this is what I want you to see. When God is working and God's in something, you don't have to force it. And you'll notice in the story, Ruth doesn't argue with them. She doesn't say, oh, there must be some kind of loophole. She just said, okay, fine. Now, let me just say something here to those of you who are single. And uh, maybe you're in dating relationships or you're considering it. If you're in a dating relationship and it's turbulent and it's stormy and it's rocky, I would just encourage you to be very, very careful because this is what I promise you. If you're fighting before you get married, you'll still be fighting when you get married. Living together in the same house, you know, being able to have sex without being on God's, you know, bad side, you know. That's not the answer. It may even make it worse. I told you, me and Laura, we saved ourselves for marriage. I was 22. She was 19 when we got married. About the third day of our honeymoon, she was on the hotel balcony. Like, I will jump if you come near me again. So it, it's a, it may not help. It may not take the tension away, right? But my point is simply this. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> She's not at this service. That's just between us. But anyway, <clears throat> if God's not leading you through the dating stage, He's probably not going to be leading you through the stages of marriage. So my encouragement to you would be don't force it. By the way, let me, let me just say this. A lot of this could be avoided if we just live by a biblical principle that is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. This is what it says. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now let me ask you a question. 
When God came up with this principle, was he, was he discriminating against people who aren't Christians? No, no. It's just actually just practical truth. God is saying our closest friends, especially the people that we date, we should have the same spiritual focus, the same spiritual values, the same spiritual precepts. Now, why would God say this specifically as it relates to dating? Well, it's because if you're dating someone, no matter if it's the first date, no matter how casual the date may be, you know what you're thinking? You're thinking, this might be the one. This could be the one. And Amos said in Amos chapter 3, how can two walk together unless they're agreed? I mean, if you have different goals and different priorities and different values in life, how can, how can you go in the same direction? And you know what God knows? Again, this is just practical. God knows how horrible it is for somebody to be married to someone and you can't share with them what's most precious to you, your faith, your relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, one of you is going to be going one way and one of you is going to want to go the other way. One of you is going to be tapped into God's power and you're committed to being obedient to his values and the other is going to be tapped into something else. And one of you is going to have one philosophy about how you should raise the children and the spiritual aspect of their life and one of you is going to have another one. And one of you is going to have a different priority about how you handle your finances and it's just going to be all this tension. So God says, don't even get in that situation. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, Mike, I would never let that happen and I know you have good intentions, but this is how it happens. You say, you know what? I'm going to do it God's way. I am going to hold out. I'm going to find a godly person to marry. But if you're not careful, see, the longer you're single and alone, sometimes you begin to soften and change and you get a little less discriminating, you know? I mean, your original standard was it's got to be a rock solid disciple, follower of Jesus Christ. But somehow that segues into, well, at least he has a pulse, you know? Well, I'm interested, right? Now, by the way, greatest lie ever. I can change him. I can change him. No one has ever sat in my office and said, you know what? I fixed her. Oh, we used to have a lot of problems when we got married, but I fixed him. You'll never hear that because it's a lie. It just doesn't work that way. So my advice, just take your time. Don't force it. Try, don't try to make it work. You're, I'm telling you, you're better to cut your losses before you get married. The pain, because here's the deal. Once you say I do, God's going to hold you to it. He didn't really care about your happiness. In fact, you know what God created marriage? To kill you. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, it's working. Yeah. You got to die to yourself to be married. And if that doesn't kill you, he gave you children. So I'm just telling you. But here's the deal. He didn't really care whether you're happy or not. It's not even based on love. I've had people come to my office, yes, we don't love each other anymore. And I'm like, whoa, I thought this was going to be a big deal. Because it's not based on love, it's based on commitment. It's a covenant. You know what a covenant is? Let me give you a definition. We don't have covenants in our culture. We deal with contracts. A covenant was like an ancient contract. Here's a definition of a covenant in the Bible. To bond something together or to shackle two things together. What did God say marriage was? Two becoming one. You can't separate it. And a covenant in the Old Testament had four parts. There were the terms, I'll do this if you do that. There was the oath, and that was spoken to one another. There was the ratification, and you would do something symbolically to demonstrate that you were entering into this covenant together. And then there was the curse. If you don't keep your end of the deal, this is what's going to happen to you. If I don't keep my end of the deal, this is what's going to happen to me. Now, whether you realize it or not, you've seen three of the four parts of a covenant at a wedding. I mean, think about it. There's the charge. You know, the minister says, do you promise to love and cherish and keep it, yada, yada, yada. And the couple says, we do. But that sets the term for the covenant that you're getting ready to enter into. And then there's the oath, right? We call those the vows, right? For better, for worse, for rich, for poor. And then how do we symbolically ratify the covenant? We, we exchange rings, right? The only thing we don't have in our modern day weddings is the curse. And I'm thinking about adding it back in to my wedding ceremonies. Because I'm thinking, you know, that's why marriages aren't holding up. We've taken out the curse. And the curse is basically this. Billy Bob, if you don't do what you say, her dad's got a really big gun. See, that, that's, that would make marriages, I think, stay together. That's what God expects of us when we get married. Now, listen, if you've been divorced two or three times, and I, I'm not, this is not about you feeling guilty. The past is the past. You can't change it. 
But at some point, you have to start moving forward doing things God's way. So even if you've been divorced 10 times, that's fine. Don't feel guilty about it. But say from here on out, I'm going to do it God's way. I'm making a covenant that God expects me to keep. So make sure when you get in that covenant, you're not forcing it, that it's where God's leading you. But we learn from Ruth the right reaction to the possibility of companionship. And let me just give you a principle here. Our desires are never to supersede God's principles. In other words, we don't compromise God's principles just because we think it will make us happy. So be really, really careful. Act four, the right response to marriage. See, So Ruth is over here just waiting, right? While she's waiting, Boaz goes, down, goes out and he hunts down the closest relative. And eventually he finds this guy. And he wants to know, are you really the appropriate guardian redeemer? And if he is, you kind of get the feeling Though Boaz is like, okay, I'll back off. I'm good with it. I mean, I think he wants God to be honored in this whole process. And that's not just idealism. That's the way it should be. So Boaz finds this guy. And he says, are you the one? And sure enough, the guy says, yep, I'm the one. And Boaz is like, well, are you available? And so you get to Ruth chapter 4, verse 6. It says that this, the guardian redeemer said, I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. And can you imagine how Boaz felt at that moment? I mean, he's texting Ruth, you won't believe this. I found a guy and he's not, you know. So it says in Ruth chapter 4, verse 13, and here's how the story concludes. Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. Anybody know what the son's name was? Obed. O-B-E-D. One of the great names in the Bible. If you name your boy Obed, guaranteed to play in the NFL. I mean, that's going to be <clears throat> Obed. Obed grew up and had a son. His son's name was Jesse. Jesse grew up and had a son. And his name was David. We'll see David next week in 1 Samuel. And from David's descendants, we get Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. By the way, do you know who Boaz's mom was? You know her? Rahab the harlot. That was Boaz's mom. In Jesus' family tree, I tell people, Rahab, she put the ho, ho, ho in Christmas. She's right there. She's right there. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Two lessons. Even in the worst of time, God still has people of integrity. Don't ever forget that. Even when it looks like the world is going to hell in a handbasket, I promise you, God still has people of integrity. Regardless of what you think, not everybody is doing it. Not everybody's doing it. Christians may be in the minority. But I'm telling you, there are still plenty of people in our culture trying to live God's way. In fact, let me just say this. Some of you who are singles, I truly believe you're some of God's choicest instruments in the worst of times. In fact, I've been so impressed with some of the singles I've met around here, some of the school teachers, people that are, are interested in full-time ministry and making it, it just blows my mind. I believe that you are some of God's choicest instruments in the worst of times. So even in the worst of times, God still has people of integrity. Second. In spite of normal and natural desires, God is still to be glorified. Regardless of what you feel, what you desire, you still have to do it God's way. Now, let me just tell you, regardless of what your past is, it's never too late to start doing what's right. Ever. It's never too late to draw the line in the sand and say, this was how I used to be. But I'll tell you what, now that I know better, this is how it's going to be. From here on out, I'm telling you, it is never too late to start living life God's way. And when you do that, God will bring a peace and a joy and a contentment and a happiness in your life that you never thought possible. But I promise you this as a Christian, and I said it last week, you will never find happiness in disobedience. It's not even possible. It's not even possible. 
Father, we thank you for Ruth. Wow, just this bright, shining diamond in the midst of chaos. Where we're just reminded not everybody was doing it. Not everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. There were a few, like Boaz and Ruth, who says, no. We serve the living God. He's given us his truth, his principles, his precepts. If it's not his way, then it's no way. Father, somehow help us understand that that's where we find peace. That's truly where we find peace. That we can be happier being obedient, more obedient to you. We can be happier being obedient to you than we can in pursuing things that we think will make us happy. Give us the courage to live that way. In your name we pray. Amen.